request smuggling. This is going to be a, a, a sort of primer on request smuggling because like I say, it's a big topic. Let's say that I'm the attacker and I want to exploit request smuggling against a target. Maybe I want to get to a resource that should require authentication without providing a username and a password. So me as the attacker, there's my little laser pointer, I will send two requests. Um, I will send a post request, which goes to the login page. That's an unprotected resource, right? I don't require any authentication to get to it. The body of my post request, where you would normally see username and password, will actually be a get for a protected resource. Now remember, that's the body of the post. So it's not a second request. It's just data within the post request. And then I'll send a second request to another unprotected resource, like favicon.ico, right? It's something that anyone can get to. You don't need any authorization to get to it. So I send those off. Now, for smuggling to be exploitable, like we just said, you kind of need a front end and a back end. And basically, in all cases of smuggling, you need a front end and a back end. Now, in this example, the front end is going to handle all of the authentication and authorization tasks, and the back end is going to be servicing the actual requests. So you could think of this like um, a microservices architecture or something like that, where you have a system that is making sure that someone is authorized to get to a resource, and then another system that's actually going to do the heavy lifting to get the data or whatever it is that the request is asking for. Now, my target's front end understands these requests in the same way that I sent them. So it, it understands this as a post for an unprotected resource. And it doesn't even look at the body content of the post because all the front end cares about is, am I supposed to be able to get to login.php or not? And it sees a second request for favicon.ico, which again, all it cares about is, am I supposed to be able to get to that resource or not? And the answer for both is yes. So it sends them on to the back end. Now, and here's where the problem happens. The back end understands the requests differently to the front end. That's the, the key to request smuggling is always that you have two systems. They disagree on how to process what they receive. The back end sees a post request for login.php and then it sees a get for the protected resource. And the get for favicon.ico just kind of gets glued onto the end of this get, kind of gets swallowed into the smuggled get. Now, like I say, the back end assumes that the front end handled all of the auth. So even though this is a protected resource and I never supplied any credentials, the back end doesn't care because it thinks the front end took care of that. And what it will do is send two responses back. It'll send the PHP for the login page. Well, the HTML actually for the login page. And then it will send the HTML that belongs to the protected resource. So it satisfied these two requests. They go off to the front end. Now the front end, remember the front end saw two requests, right? It saw a post and this get was just part of the body content and it saw a get for fab icon. So it's expecting two responses. It's expecting some HTML for the login page and an icon. But what it actually gets is the HTML for the login page and the HTML for the protected resource. But again, the front end doesn't care. It sent two requests and it got two responses. So as far as it's concerned, it did its job. They're both run protected resources as far as it's concerned. So it sends them to the client. And the client is the attacker in this case. And what the attacker gets back then is a response with the login page and the protected resource response. And I have successfully bypassed authentication by smuggling my get in the body of a post. Now that's, in a nutshell, request smuggling. Exactly how you smuggle the get in the post varies depending on the systems you're attacking. It's going to vary depending on the combination of systems that you're attacking, in fact, the front end and the back end. It will almost always involve careful manipulation of two headers the transfer encoding header or the content length header. Those two headers tell web servers, proxies, caches, everything, how they should understand the body content that goes with a post request, how that body content should be encoded and how long it is. And smuggling is possible when these two systems, the front and the back end, disagree on how to handle those headers. So maybe one system ignores a content length header if there's leading white space in front of the header name. Right. In which case, let's say the front end ignores the leading white space. It thinks it's a zero byte post because there was no content length. But maybe and that's not the case. Right. There was there was body content. Maybe you send both headers transfer encoding chunked and a content length. 
and one system honors the content length header and the other system honors the transfer encoding header. And again, you get a disagreement between the front end and the back end on how they should pass that post request and strange things may happen, right? It's, it's highly dependent on the systems you're trying to attack and it requires a, a good deal of investigation on the part of an attacker. But this investigation is is pretty well understood at this point. This, this technique has many variations. It's been documented quite well over the years now by folks like James Kettle from Portswigger. Uh, Portswigger make Burp Suite. Burp Suite has a whole bunch of things built into it to try and find request smuggling vectors. So if you want to inspect your own systems, Burp Suite is very, very good tool to use to find this. It's been documented by research groups like Praetorian and Malicious Group. And there's there's way too much to cover in, in one slide, but that's a, a good overview, I think, of how request smuggling works.